So, hello, I'm going to give you a small talk about multi-tenant database system and good, bad and ugly sides of things. So first quick presentation, I'm Pierre Ducroquet, so I'm sorry for your ears with my English pronunciation that is going to be quite wacky sometimes. I'm a developer on DBA since about 10 years, so sorry for my past mistakes. And right now I'm working at Entrouvert, a small French, uh, mostly software as a service company. You may have heard of it, of it because we pwned uh, Orange in a uh, jurisdiction case recently. And well, this whole presentation is about things I wish I had never seen in both this job and previous jobs. I've been told by my therapist to get some things out, so this is the way. And I really hope you won't fall in the same traps as I did, because really you don't want that. So in order to m get things a bit more interesting, just a quick question. How many tables you have on your production server and server, not servers? And how many indexes? Right now on my main production system, it was about one hour ago, so it must have raised a bit already. We were at... 240,000 tables and almost 1 million indexes. One last thing, I guess you're not a developer, so you understand the pain. Is there a lot of developers around here? So I, okay, I will, uh, I will show you why you don't, you should not do some things, but if you do things that way, doing many tables and indexes, the nice thing is that you developers won't have too much pain. It will be everything for the DBA. Don't do that. Well, d decide with the DBA. So, before digging a bit further, what is a multi-tenant system? I try to find a way to describe it, but Wikipedia is here. So, a multi-tenant system is where a single instance runs on a server and shares multiple tenants, so multiple groups of users. Most common use case is going to be software as a service, where you will have each customer in a of, well, several customers on a server, and each customer doesn't share data with other customers, hopefully. Otherwise, it's a security leak. So from a database point of view, this is what it looks like. You've got one set of data for tenant one, one set for tenant two, and so on. This is theory. We all like theory. We all want to go there one day, but sadly, we do not. Reality looks a bit more like that. The difference is that customer one is not going to use the same features as customer two, so everything you thought was right in one case is absolutely wrong in the second one. And then there is a call from the commercial team. Hey, we've got a new customer coming in, uh, live in two days. He's going to look like that. And next, day, next week, you will have another customer once again doubling your database say, size. And again, this all happened to me in real life. And sometimes co commercial teams don't understand the impact of sizes. So how do we implement that on a database? Let's look at the simplest query there is. So dump off a table, expand it a bit. So we can implement it on database side, one database pertinent, one schema pertinent, or all in one table and let's pray everything goes right. Don't go that way, I'll show you why. There, there are people going to say, okay, you just have to use Kubernetes or something else and deploy one PostgreSQL instance per customer. I didn't go that way because I have only one server serving hundreds of customers and everything goes fine. And uh, I used con containers or other virtualization meta methods. Every CPU resources will be used for c containers or for stuff like that. Uh, it will be a huge loss and I think we will at, at least require twice the hardware we have right now. So if you are interested in doing such kind of deployment using containers, virtual machines, that's not a topic here because it's a sysadmin topic, not a DBA topic. So on the database side, as we saw, one tenant, one schema, or everything with 
some bits of tentidy clones spread everywhere, or PostgreSQL extensions. I'm going to be quite quick about PostgreSQL extensions, sadly, because there's an I saw only the CTS extension is quite new, so I never had the opportunity of digging into it. And there is one issue I have with such extension. It's we, you must design application for CTS. I'm sorry, uh, you don't know about Darwin or evolution. Most people develop their application thinking, OK, there is one customer. And then later, they think, oh, we must sell to more than one customer. Too late. So very sorry. The natural way done by most developers to use to do a multi ton system is the ton tidy column. First issue security. Are you all going to trust that every place in your application is going to have the criteria on ton and tidy? I thought it was possible, but obviously it's not. Second problem that's for the DBA to suffer. You know how PostgreSQL works? You know, and you've got a query, you start thinking, OK, how to execute that query? And you have to get the statistics and try to guess the proper execution path. The issue with the term tidy column is that you've got all this data in one, set one table, and you've got statistics covering what it can. Not a lot, because your table is going to be far too huge. And the optimizer will start going crazy. If I've got enough time, I'll show how deep I had to go that way. And when you start thinking about calling your extensions magic, there's something definitely wrong. Indexing is harder. Because right now, I saw some developments around it for PostgreSQL 17, I think. Uh, it was on hackers, but I didn't dig into the threads recently. Right now, PostgreSQL uses one index for a table. Right? It can, you can trick it to using several at a time, but it's far less efficient. So you start thinking, OK, should I have my tenant ID in each index? So your index are going to be blotted as hell. Or should I start to have index for specific tenants? Because customer two is far too big. It's going to be crazy if we don't have one, tenant, one index for it. This is quite tricky to, to do. Yes, there are tools for that, mostly POA uh, or PG profile we saw earlier. Maybe I didn't use that tool. F if you don't know POA, check it out. It's quite great. It's a tool built uh, providing you a web interface over PG stat statements, stat calculation, a few other things. And it tells you what is taking time in your database, which query is slow, what it is doing, if it's uh, disk I.O. or things like that. It's a great tool, and I'll, I sadly cannot use it anymore. More on that later. But for if you have to manage a database system where multi tenancy is done that way, I think you definitely want this tool. The issue you will have is that the tenant ID is a parameter of your query, and no tool will log the parameters. So you will have to guess. That query is slow. Why is it not slow when I test it? Because you've tested it on 200 tenants, and it's on the 400 tenants that it's going to be slow. That's the kind of trick. So why is it slow? Good luck. So it's, it, it's going to be quite hard. You, you are going to, de to develop nice queries, nice joints, nice, nice plans, and it will all fall apart because there is one customer that is unlike the others. And you have absolutely no, no way of knowing that because it's all in the same package. So this is not going to, to go great. Most tools, on, on the bright side, most Postgres tools are going to work fine. What I showed you earlier with 200,000 tables, almost three, one million indexes, a lot of tools are going to break if you reach these numbers. On a, a database with 10 tidy columns, you don't have a lot of tables. You've got 100, 1,000 tables, even, even 10,000 tables. You're still one order of magnitudes under uh, what I have to work with. And a lot of tools, well, most tools don't care. It's going to be a bit, a bit slower because, yes, you've got your one terabyte table. 
okay, but tools don't explode because suddenly transferring files over the network, transferring small files is the biggest task when restoring a backup. That's what I have more on that later. And now for something ridiculous, and it's a true story. Hi, from Big Boss. Could you come on that silly other meeting tool? There is a security emergency and we need you. I'm a DBA. What, what happened? What could go wrong? And this is what happened. I was called because I did a proof of concept that maybe we could use raw level security for tenants. Um, do you know what raw level security is? Quickly show offense for those who don't know, so I, okay, I'll, I'll quickly explain. In PostgreSQL, you can add a criteria on the tables that is going to say, okay, if you want to fetch this row of the, of the table, it, you must meet this criteria in order to display it. It's a security, you, instead of having just security per table, per column, you have security per row. So you can have a user ID, that's a typical example. And what I thought was a good idea was to use this with tenant ID. Because I thought, yeah, so developers are going to forget. And they forgot, and the customer noticed. And uh, when the customer starts seeing data from other customers, things go wrong quickly. And uh, it was faster for me, DBA, to deploy role level security than for developers to patch the application. Because why not? I, d I, d I have no idea why it went that way. That's a silly company. Don't, don't even try that, please. Really, that's, that's a false good idea, but so I, 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 I rewrite that so you know don't go that way. Because relevant security is for PCI DSS, so credit card security standards, things like that. You're going to use a bazooka to catch a fly. And it's going to be messy as hell, and basically you are going to have to patch the PostgreSQL functions themselves in order to make them usable and make the optimizer happy. It's going to be very, very messy. Your, your backups are not going, some backups are not going to be restored properly. You have to patch things afterwards and so on. Don't go that way. Just so you know, it is here. If one of your developer messes as bad as the developers there were in that past job, you can try that to save yourself not much more. So, let's go far away from this nightmare and let's go into a more DBA-like nightmare. One database per tenant. I didn't show that on my server right now. I've got about 300 databases. That's because we have about a, a bit under 300 customers. More about that later. So you can still have security breaches, but it must happen in the application before the application connects to the target database. So it means a lot less cost code is traveled and your developers are less likely to mess things up there or the frameworks are less likely to be messed up. I never saw any security issue with this multi-tenancy system. Because there's, I never saw any case where, where the application was forced into connecting to another arbitrary database. So that's, that's the brightest side. You don't have these issues. Your indexing is going to be far easier because you don't have one, te one terabyte size table. That doesn't happen. You, uh, you are going to have uh, 300 uh, database with 300 tables with the same name, but each one is going to be far smaller. So most of the time you will not even need indexes because your tables are going to be incredibly small. Tools will work fine, most of them, because you, have, you don't have huge databases. My biggest one has Three, uh, sorry, uh, 100,000 tables. That's far too much, but that's the way of the next ten system. But your tools are going to un enjoy using ba backing up, for instance, table uh, databases with 1,000 tables. That's going to work fine. But 
things will, ha will get slow because they back up a lot of databases. Just that. Connection pooling. That's your main pain point, actually. Do you all know why we need po co connection pooling? Most of you? So most of connection pooling tools are pgbouncer, pgpool, I saw pgcat recently, odyssey, there are others, there are pooling tools integrated in applications. Uh, from my experience, there's only one usable for this kind of tenancy system, it's pgbouncer, because it's the only one not requiring you to write configuration for each database, and you don't want to write thousands of lines of configuration. Postgres pgbouncer has a nice auto database. But you will still have an issue because each customer will be on a different database, so you will still have hundreds, if not thousands, of connections to your PostgreSQL, and there's not much you can do there. It's by design. So this is what is going to be the, most, the biggest limitation for the scalability of your system. If you start going over thousands of customers, you will have to start splitting in several PostgreSQL instances. That's sadly the way of things, but hopefully I've not I don't have any figure to give you yet because I've not reached that wall, but I promise you the day I reach it, I will write about it. Another great tool, PGStat Statements. Do you all know what it is? Yeah, best tool ever. Forget it. I mean it. It's, it's unusable for this situation, and uh, that's the biggest pain point. Do you all know how PGStat statements work? I guess not. So quick explanation. PGStat statements is doing your profiling by looking at the query ID and storing some statistics about it, like query one to three run 1,000 times, it took from that duration to that duration, and so on. The thing is that it has a table in memory c that can contain at most 10,000 100,000 queries. I've got, as I showed you earlier, I've got 300,000 tables. Each table can have select, insert, update, delete. Let's say there are five different select possible, so I'm, I'm already at 10 query per table. 10 times 300,000, it's 3 million. And these stats and statements just cannot hold 3 million queries in memory, and that's still far from how many it would have to store to be usable there. So I am completely blind there on my servers. I have no ID. I, I cannot have the insight that pgstat statements give me, and there are tools like PGPower, pgprofile, and so on that are going to go crazy because if they start looking at the data, they'll see query one, two, and three. If they start looking just one second later, these three queries are gone, replaced by 10,000 other queries, and so on. So PGStat statements is unusable there. There are some tricks you can try to enable it for one database only, but you are not going to have a perfect picture of what is happening on your server with that. And that, that's what the saddest part for me right now, and I, again, I have no solution, but uh, that's what I'm going to work on later on, because this is the biggest pain point, point here. And can I you use logical replication? I did not dare try it. I see one person laughing, so are you voting no? You, you are voting no or voting yes? No, okay. I agree. So for those who don't know the difference between physical and logical replication in, the, in PostgreSQL, physical replication is simple. The server sends the log of, the, of uh, physical changes on disk to another server. The other server replaces it, and that's a perfect replication. They are binary identical on disk. Logical replication works differently. On the primary server, you've got decoders that are reading the binary log, decoding it, and sending the decoded changes to other targets. 
The issue is that if you've got 300 databases, you are going to have 300 programs decoding the same binary log at the same time, only to say, I don't care about 99.9% .9 of what I saw, but they still have to decode the whole log. So I, I, I didn't try because I'm not insane, and right now logical replication is only on primary servers. I'm going to upgrade to PostgreSQL 16 soon. And there is the possibility of using logical replication on standbys. So I'm going to burn myself a CPU, and I'll hopefully tell what happens when you try something that silly. But I, I spoke to many people, and everyone either laughed or was scared when I spoke about that. So I really don't know what to expect, but except pain, of course. So this is fun for later. If someone wants to try that at home, please do. Just record it and send it to me. It will save me some time. But it's, it cannot go right. And now for the last multi-tenant system, the one I like and hate. That's I, I'm not sure about it right now. Still, I still have, uh, have issue with this one. It's one schema per tenant. So as I showed you earlier, do, does everybody know, here know what a schema here is? Or is there some developers not knowing about that? OK. So you have one database per application, for instance, and each customer has one schema. That's quite simple. So security breaches are still possible, but you are going to have, you, you, well, the security breach must be a bigger one, you must have the ability of injecting a full query instead of just changing one parameter to see the data of the, of the customer next to you. It's already trickier. It's not perfect, but it's really harder than to an tidy column. Indexing, again, it's going to be perfectly fine. You're just going to have one million indexes on your database server, but it seems to handle fine. Connection pooling. Uh, that's a fun one. More about that later, because the issue here is that you can have two ways of looking at the schemas, and most developers will use the nasty one using the search path. More about that later. Some of you may have already guessed where this is going. Tools. Don't even start looking at pgstat statements here. Don't, don't. I, it, it cannot, it cannot work. And uh, there's, I must do some bug reports and researches on this because it's, it's not just the number of queries. It's just the query normalization that is broken. Also, more a bit about that later. Well, I included it into tools. Sorry about that. Um, tools, other tools. PG dump and PG restore. You all know that tool, I guess. It's quite nice to do a quick backup. If you want to do a uh, PostgreSQL upgrade, it's a slow way. Like if you cannot use logical replication, for instance, it's a nice way. There is a nice dash g parameter, so dash jobs, if you want to run to restore 10, on tw 10, 20 CPUs at the same time. I, this is a quote from the documentation. Most time consuming steps concurrently. We don't have the same definition here because we have a multi tenant system. And this is the kind of thing that you are going to be the first one to notice. Because, well, let's look at a typical database with 100 tables or 1,000 tables. What is going to take some time to restore in this context? It's loading the data, obviously. Because you've got one gigabyte of data, it, it's 100 times uh, 10 megabytes. Okay, well, on my servers, what takes the most time is creating the tables. It's slower than loading the data. I'm not kidding, and it's, it was surprising for me too. So pgdump-g does not, doesn't make it. 
uh, the tool itself is broken. So I've got nice bash scripts around it to do the concurrency myself. And then you start having nice issues like the table of content is not built or for 100,000 tables. They never figured someone was going to be crazy enough to do that. I, I don't know why. Nobody thought about this. This, this is silly. And I started even patches to change the format because it's, it was just not done for performance. And when you start reaching that kind of level, you have performance issues. So no PG dump or hard to work with. Backups. Do you use PG backrest or do you use any other tool? If you use another tool and it works on a multi tenant system, tell me because I never found one working right. So I, I, and I, I mean it. Uh, when I started my job at this company, they, they had a small issue. They said, we have backups. We never managed to restore one. I, I was expecting more laughs. You are worry, worrying me a bit. So what was happening? Let's, I have added that, I don't know if you can read it from every part of the room. Uh, just some small statistics. On my biggest database, I've got 400,000 files. Doesn't matter if it's indexes, tables, and so on. The folders themselves, not the content of the folder, the folder on disk for the file system, the folders are in the tens of megabytes, just for the file list, not for the content. Nothing is going to like going in these folders. Don't use, even LS is going to be s slow, very slow. And, and XT4 has some issues there too. So I'm running XFS. Back to PG Backrest. Why does it work much better than other tools? Because recently, like two years ago, they added a new feature called Repo Bundle. And if you don't know that and you've got a lot of small tables, look into it. It's magic. Repo Bundle is PG Backrest saying, oh, I've got 10,000 small files. Let's put them all together in one file, one compressed file. This is a neat, neat ID, thank you. And my backups went from hundreds of thousands of files to manageable levels, and suddenly I was able to restore them much faster. One issue I have is when customer one says, hey, I need my data because I did a mistake, and I start restoring one full database with 300 schemas because I have no way of saying, okay, this table is for this schema. There's absolutely no solution there right now. I, I may look into it if, again, if I've got enough free time to spare. But this whole problem is like I tried PG Barman. PG Barman was taking far, far too much time to transfer these thousands of files. It was taking hours. Not because uh, and not using I/O because it was just latency that was killing it. So even backups are harder. A bit more so about PG stats statements because yes, as I said, you need you need a very big number of queries in memory if you want to use it on one database pertinent or one schema pertinent. But on one schema pertinent, it's worse like it's not going to make it. There's one big issue with PG stat statements, and if you want to do one, tenant, one schema pattern, you can, but you must make certain your developers use the full table names everywhere, like select all from tenant1.table1. If you don't do that, you will have like 1,000 queries with different query IDs, but 1,000 identical queries. Because the normalization tool pass done by PostgreSQL will not modify the query to write the search path, so the schema, the ri real table names that was used, but your queries are 
going to look the same to you with different IDs. It's just not working. You're, you cannot use PGStat statements on that context, sadly. And thus, POA, like for instance, or PG, PG profile are not going to work here either. Uh, I, and I mean, if someone here has any kind of idea about how to use PGStat statements there, I, you're welcome, please uh, express them. I will take anything. I've, I've even had suggestions for PGStat statements, kind of fork, I don't remember from whom, but it was not going to make it either because there were similar limitations. And, well, I was not going to trust that with my production systems immediately. And now, p connection puller. So, you all know why we need connection puller, because PostgreSQL needs one process per connected customer, or con connected application. And if you've got a lot of connected uh, applications, you are going to have thousands of processes and it's going to burn CPU uselessly. I made it short, it's a bit more complicated and hopefully late, uh, rec recent PostgreSQL upgrades did that much better. But, well, most in-application pullers are not able to optimize for multi-tenants. This, this is one issue I have already, it's that when customer one is when a connection comes in in your application for cus for customer one, it will not reuse a process that worked on this one previously. So it will say, "Okay, I'm going to search to change the search path in my application instead of reusing one that was already prepared." That's a small loss of performance, and that's a bit. It's a bit sad that it's not handled and. Anyway, they don't handle hundreds, thousands of databases, or you have to automate your configuration and it's going to go ugly and spend a lot of resources. One schema pertinence oops, sorry, is a bit complicated to do because, uh, as far as I know, only PGBooncer can do it. And it's a patch done last year by Sidious, uh, uh, if I'm right. Uh, do you see why it's such a mess there? Are you, I, I guess not a lot of people are aware with what is happening on the, light, on, on, the, on the wire. When your application uses schemas, what is often done is using the search path. Like you say, tell to PostgreSQL, set search path to customer one. And then you come and say, set search path customer two and do your query and so on. But if you are using a Boonser, the Boonser, the most optimal way is to have transaction pooling. So you are going to say, okay, set search path to customer one, end of transaction. Do your query, second transaction, you are going to be sent to another PostgreSQL process and another search path and you've got a data leak. One smile, uh, one person figured out it's wrong. And on the wire says one issue is that by default PostgreSQL does not notify that the search path has been changed. So there are two ways. Either you use a Boonser that passes every SQL query and pray it finds everything. I, didn't, I do not trust that. Or you write a one-line PostgreSQL extension that says to PostgreSQL, please notify everybody when the search path changes. Uh, if s some people are interested, I can show you the code. It's really one-liner. But it's not by default, so you will have to modify to deploy that extension if you are on GCP or something like that. You can't. And you are going to use PGBooncer with a specific configuration, and it seems it's not tested widely yet, but it seems to work. And for what I said, one database per tenant works fine with PGBooncer, but other tools like PGCAT, Odyssey, and so on, I started to look into it, and I didn't want to write thousands of configuration lines. And I, I have no idea about the consequences, because most of them will start threads or processes per 
a database in configuration is not going to scale very well. Monitoring tools. This is a nice graph. I have no idea how to do any kind of usable graphs with this number of databases. This is unusable. You've got hundreds of things all together. You can see you have, you've got your big customers over there, and everybody small is there. Great. Why is customer? Why is this one? Why is this one com complaining? I don't know. Somewhere, it went wrong. Also, monitoring tools sometimes are going to look at per table, per schema things. That's going to be even more lines of on the graph, so it won't work. And as far as I know, none of them actually works with schemas. They don't go tell you this schema is using more size or doing more queries than that other because either the information is not there or they didn't implement that. A lot of people don't know about schemas when they write tools. So it's wrong. So a quick summary. So rabbit holes everywhere. There is no perfect solution to multi tenant systems. I showed you tenant ID column. Don't go there. Please, everyone, some da someone does that. It's a, a receipt for failure. You are going to have security issues. And with uh, RG uh, G RGPD, and I don't remember the English acronym for that, sorry, with the uh, yeah, I think with the regulations in, uh, for the data privacy in Europe, it's you don't want security issues of that kind because you've got legal obligation of notifying several authorities and communication thing and so on, and it's going to be terrible for your company if you have that kind of issue. And I've been developer too, and I thought I could write perfect code, but let's face it, no human can write perfect code. So the less code you have, and the less security sensitive code you have, the better it is. Right now, uh, I, on, my, I, on my current job, we've got both schema pertinent and database pertinent, depending on the application. It works quite well, except for some tools, and that's DBA sweat. But this is, I think, the only sane way if you don't want to spend hundreds of thousands in virtual machines, servers, and things like that. If you can, before committing to any of these solutions, fix, uh, try, try to, to test it and f figure out what you are going to have to fix to make it work. Because there's no perfect solution, but uh, the trade-offs are yours to decide in the end. And well, for DBAs having to face these kind of things, but on a happy face because that's, I think, what makes our job really interesting. I uh, enjoy having to go into PostgreSQL source code to find out why pgdump is that slow. But maybe I'm a bit special. I don't know. And yeah, there are worse things, but I will not dare pronounce them. Yeah, it's say that f bad things happen when you say these names three times. So thank you very much. If there is any question, and if there is some spare time, I've got worst thing put on later. But questions may be more interesting. So questions. First one there. Uh, you can maybe tell it, and I will re repeat if you want. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, with the uh, latest PostgreSQL release, public schemas is more restricted than it was. And do you f uh, do I think that it will make tools or framework developers more aware of schemas? I stopped believing in Santas years ago, so I will not believe in that either. The issue is that PostgreSQL has schemas, SQLite, MariaDB, MySQL don't. So, sadly, what most people learn at school, and it's still MySQL or 
even worse things like access and so on. And these tools don't have schemas, and people don't see. I discovered schema because I used pgadmin on uh, PostgreSQL 8, and I saw, oh, what is that level? But the public change doesn't change much, sad sadly. For not, it doesn't change enough for people to notice that there is one layer, layer there. Thank you very much. Welcome. Well, What's your opinion about using role-level security for multi-tenant? The issue with role-level security is that you have to, when you use a function in a query, like uh, where my function equals something, that function must be marked as leak-proof to tell the, to PostgreSQL that, okay, you can run it on data the customer cannot see. So the application cannot see. And every query you are going to do is going to run functions. Because operators in PostgreSQL are, are functions. And if you start using, for instance, full text search, trigram, things like that in PostgreSQL, none of these functions are marked leaked proof. Because sometimes they are not. They were not tested that way. And so when you start to enable low-level security, you are going to have these queries that were fast using indexes, and suddenly they are not, because the functions must, the filtering must be done before the functions are, are run, and so the slow path is going to be done in the in the query plan. So relevant security is usable, but it's quite tricky. You must monitor. You must make certain you st you always have your functions properly marked as leak proof, even. PostgreSQL provided functions. So this change are not going to survive uh, PG dump, PG restore. Th it's a lot of work. It's not impossible. We did that. But most of the time, you don't want to go that way. Because in the end, role level security is done for PCI DSS stuff, like high security stuff. There's no in-between level, like saying it's role level security, but we don't care that much about security. It's security, no security. It's black and white, there's no gray, and that's what is missing in the end. I hope it, it was clear. I have a, one quick remark and a question. The remark is that we avoid the uh, search pass pr problem by injecting directly from the application the, the name of the tenant. Yeah, we, have a multiple, we have a multi-tenant application with a, using the schema method. So every request we send is select customer one dot my table. Yeah, much much better indeed. But when you use things like Django, you cannot. <laughs> and my question is: uh, so today we have uh, one schema per customer. Uh, we have around 500 customers, and the question is: uh, when do we have to worry? Uh, at what point do we have to start worrying and uh, start uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, starting a new server and sharding customers between two servers? I see the wall there too. I still don't know when I will start running into it. But I, 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 yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer yet. One day I will have it and it will not be a pretty day for me. S sadly, I, there's no clear definition. If you look into the PostgreSQL documentation, there's no known limitation or reachable limitation to the number of tables, indexes, and so on. But you are going to have. I think auto vacuum is starting to suffer on my server, but I have not digged into that enough, so I have not even included that in the talk because I'm not certain that I don't want to spread any kind of FUD. But yeah, toolings like auto vacuum, uh, cat cache, or things like that in, post in PostgreSQL are going to bloat over time because you start to have far too many relations. I think one million tables is far is too much already. So I, I'm, I'm going to start worrying at two, three thousand, two, two or three hundred thousand tables in one database and there I'm going to start splitting because I want to survive. But there are a lot of issues with the application being uh, able of saying, okay, for this one, okay, I must connect on another database so the application side routing is going to be messy as hell. One more. 
Um, and you have told it uh, right now, but how do you configure auto vacuum with such many tables? Badly. My, my, I won't go to the, too deep into that, but my configuration right now, it's, I've made it more aggressive, but it's still not enough from what I've started to gather. Uh, when I did my configuration two years ago, it was, it seemed to go right, but from the blow time thing, uh, I miss, I messed things up. So, indeed, auto vacuum is going to be, to require some innovation in configuration. I I've found no no tutorial or things like that handling this kind of case. I don't know why, <laughs> but yes, it's. I mean, can such a use case in my 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 case. And I think you, you have to balance between uh, IOs and uh, bloat. And you can uh, afford bloat. You will have it. And uh, in my company, in, in my progress SQL, I manage it with a uh, vacuum full. It's yeah. a, it is possible because we have a lot of back-end uh, jobs, so it, it's not pain for the clients, for the customers. But uh, it's very, um, very difficult. Yeah. And one solution, my point of view, and you, I don't know if you really uh, talk to it, is to separate in several servers. You have to do charting, multi-databases to uh, manage, uh, maybe, in a, it's one of the solution, to divide the charge of um, the load of auto vacuum to uh, split on uh, several servers. Uh, I agree with that, but sadly, uh, well, first, multitenant is single instance, so I stick to that definition here. And sadly, if you start to do that, you are going to require more, new, more human resources. And I'm a single DBA. So, and, and it's, also, it's also the application side. So it's, it's going back to the same question as the previous one. You're going to have to start routing in your application customers, both on database and schema. It's going to be harder. It's not impossible, but you must get everybody on board, do the development, trust it's going to work fine and so on. It's more complicated, but I still think auto vacuum can be made to work. Maybe some patches are required in PostgreSQL. I'm going to go that way because that's what I enjoy doing. But yes, auto vacuum is not solved for this kind of case. Thanks. I don't think Pierre. we have time for more. It's do we? time for tea, so round of applause for Pierre. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.